Good morning and welcome to our Easter Day services from Man Pleasant Baptist Church. My name is the Reverend Paul Lavender. Thank you for joining us today. And let me encourage you to join with me right now as we greet one another with these words, Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. Please say again, Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. Let's bow our heads and together as we begin this time of celebration and thanksgiving, let's call on the name of the Lord and remember his risen presence with us now. The Apostle Peter said, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us a new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Gracious Father, God of love, we rejoice in the glorious resurrection of your Son, our Saviour Jesus Christ. We praise and thank you for his triumph over death to reign as Lord of life. Father, would you strengthen us today, grant us a firm faith that we may know the presence of Jesus with us, our wonderful counsellor and our true friend. We pray together. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Jesus Christ. We continue to raise our hallelujahs in thanksgiving to God for all that he's done for us through Jesus Christ. And I want to encourage you and bless you as a church this morning with even more reasons to thank God. You'll know that a few weeks ago I wrote to you outlining our financial position as a church and how towards the end of the year we might struggle uh, because of a shortfall in giving as a result of the church being closed for regular worship. And the shop being closed. Well, I'm delighted to share with you today uh, that through the generosity of God's people and in thanksgiving for all that God has done for us, around £20,000 has already been given. And I'm so grateful to God for the way he's moved among us and released this finance. Another sign of God at work among us. And I invite you now as we thank God today for new life, we pray that this financial resource will be well used uh, for the ministry and the mission of the church 
to see the good news of the resurrection taken to all the corners of the earth so that we might share what Jesus has done for us. So let's bow our heads in prayer as we bring our thanksgiving to the Lord today. Lord, as we watch the news and sometimes all we see on the news is depressing, evil and death always seems to have the last word in so much of what we uh, absorb through the media. There's so much fighting and pain, so many deaths. There seems to be so little that we can do except stand and watch from afar like those first disciples. But we thank you that nothing can stop your power, the power of Jesus' love, even on the cross where he forgave his enemies. Thank you that the love of Christ has broken the power of evil and death. Thank you that God's love has the final and the best word. Thank you that on Easter Day the tomb is empty and Jesus is risen. Thank you for this, the greatest news of all. May it shape our lives, form our witness and lead us to honour you in every way. We pray through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. There's this crazy story at the beginning of the Bible. We have Adam and Eve and they're in the Garden of Eden. And everything in this garden is great. It's exactly as it should be, except... There's this one tree that they're told by God not to eat from because it's dangerous and it will kill them. So that's it. Uh, avoid this fruit tree and we're fine. Right. It seems pretty simple. But in this garden, there's a snake. And it starts telling a different story. It says that if you eat of this tree, it's not going to kill you. In fact, it's going to make you become like God. And Adam and Eve, they believe the snake and they eat the fruit. And because of this, the goodness of the garden is tragically lost and evil and death enters into God's good world. Now, why is there a talking snake in the garden? I mean, this thing is a problem. Yeah, it's very strange. And even more strange is the fact that the Bible doesn't say why or how this thing even got there. It just presents the snake as this creature who's in rebellion against God and that wants to get other people to doubt God's goodness and lead them on a path towards death. And so whatever this snake is, it's the source of evil that pervades our world and our lives even still today. But there is some hope because right here in the story, God makes this really interesting promise to Adam and Eve. That someone is going to come in the future, a son of Eve. And this guy's going to come and he's going to crush the serpent's head and destroy evil at its source. However, during this battle, the serpent is going to bite this guy's heel. So it's like a mutual destruction. Yeah, it's this very strange but beautiful promise. And it's just left hanging there until the next key moment in the story when God singles out this guy named Abraham and says that through his family, goodness and blessing is going to be restored back to all of the nations of the world. And as we follow this family, we get to one of Abraham's great grandsons, this guy named Judah. And he receives this promise that a king is going to come from his line and that the whole world's going to follow this king and he's going to bring peace and harmony and there'll be lots of food and wine and milk and vineyards and it's going to be awesome. The first king that we meet from the line of Judah is a guy named King David. And he's a hero. Maybe he is the snake crusher. But it turns out that David is infected with the same evil as the rest of humanity. He never crushes the snake, just the opposite. However, God makes a promise to David that this king is going to eventually come from his line. But as you go on in the story, one by one, each generation of his sons, they're just total my mind to Calvary where Jesus bled and died for me I see his wounds his hands his feet my savior on that cursed tree His body bowed 
and drenched in tears They laid him down in Joseph's tomb The ancient seal by heavy stone Messiah still and all Bible reading this morning comes from the Gospel according to John, chapter 20, beginning to read at the first verse. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the tomb. So she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, and said to them, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, 
and I do not know where they have laid him. Then Peter and the other disciple set out and went towards the tomb. The two were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent down to look in and saw the linen wrappings lying there, but he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came, following him, and went into the tomb. He saw the linen wrappings lying there, and the cloth that had been on Jesus' head, not lying with the linen wrappings, but rolled up in the place by itself. Then the other disciple, who reached the tomb first, also went in, and he saw and believed, for as yet they did not understand the scripture, that he must rise from the dead. Then the disciples returned to their homes. But Mary stood weeping outside the tomb. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb, and she, she saw two angels in white sitting where the body of Jesus had been lying, one at the head and the other at the feet. They said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, They have taken my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. When she had said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? For whom are you looking? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him in Hebrew, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said to her, Do not yet hold on to me, for I have not ascended to the Father. But go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my father and your father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I You were the word at the beginning One with God, the Lord most high You're here
A young man from a particularly wealthy background was about to graduate from university. And the custom in the particular part of the country where he lived was that upon graduation, he might be given a car because it was a very affluent suburb and it was, if you wanted to keep up with the Joneses, the thing to be done. Before graduation, the father and son went to a local car dealership and saw a car that they liked. But on the eve of the graduation, the father handed the son not a set of car keys, but a gift-wrapped Bible. And the son was so angry that he threw down the Bible, walked out of the house, and never spoke with his father again. And then he went back to the house when his father had died. And one night, going through his father's possessions, he found again the Bible that his father had given him. And he opened up the Bible and saw inside the front page a cheque made out for the exact amount that that car that they'd seen together would have been purchased with. So I thought about that story. I couldn't help but wonder how many people in the world have done exactly the same thing to God. They've literally tossed aside a wonderful promise because they didn't understand it, they didn't believe it was possible, uh, or they didn't understand it. Because if it seems too good to be true, we're told, then it probably is. We're advised so often never to be taken in by empty promises. Don't believe the lie that you can have something for nothing. The world simply doesn't work like that. And so many advertisements that we see around us promise us a life that's so fulfilled. You can have the life you want. You can be happy, rich, famous, successful in business if you'll just use this particular body spray. Now, we know how ridiculous that may sound, but we get lulled into believing it's too often. But God's different. Instead of promises full of emptiness, at Easter, he gives us emptiness that's full of promise. And so this morning, I want us to think about the emptiness and the empty promises of Easter. There are three of them. Three promises marked by something empty. An empty cross, an empty tomb, and empty burial clothes. And because of each of these, we can believe that God's promises are not empty, but they are true. And they can be received by you and me. Firstly, the empty cross. Because the, the cross was empty, we have the promise of forgiven sins. On that first Easter morning, at daybreak, the women who were part of Jesus' companions went to the tomb. And as they walked, and as the conversation may have been sad, they come to the top of a rise in the path, they stop motionless and quiet and look to the distance, where outside the city stands a gruesome reminder of the days just before. Over there, silhouetted by the glow of a pink sky, on top of the hill that the locals called the skull, there are three crosses. Because it had been the Sabbath, no one had removed them. So there they stand, an empty reminder of the horror of Friday. The one in the middle, that's the one I want you to see. The one upon which Jesus hung. Look at it. There was perhaps the stain of blood that came from the nails driven into Jesus' hands and feet. Blood dripping down, maybe even still, but certainly stained from where his back had bled when he'd been beaten with a cat of nine tails. Don't let anyone try to convince you that Jesus was just faking it. The Roman soldier who put a spear into Jesus' side, knew that Jesus was dead. The soldiers knew it. The Romans knew it. The Jews knew it. And they tried to make up a lie that the disciples stole the body. But you know what? That band of 11 disciples at the time, they were so disheartened and discouraged. 
they couldn't have overcome a company of Roman soldiers, moved a two-ton stone and stole Jesus' body just so they could claim he could or had come back to life. You see, Jesus really did die. That's why I want you to see the cross this morning, the place where he died, but today it's empty. Empty of Jesus' body, but full of God's promises of hope for you and for me that the empty cross means that you and I are forgiven. Because on that cross, Jesus paid the penalty for our sins. When you look at that cross, see that we've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We deserve to be punished for the things we do wrong. But as the prophet Isaiah says, looking forward to the ministry and life of the Messiah, the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Or as the Apostle Peter put it, he bore our sins in his body on the tree. Jesus paid the penalty for our sins. He took our sins. He died that we might be forgiven. And when Jesus breathed his last and said, it is finished, the penalty was paid. The work is done. The work of reconciliation. Our guilt is taken away. Because of the work that Jesus did, our sins are forgiven. Forgiven. The first empty promise of Easter is the empty cross filled with the promise of forgiven sins. Those women who were at the cross, as they go to the tomb, they ask themselves, who will move the stone for us? But when they get there, the stone has been rolled away. The stone, soldiers are unconscious and an angel is sitting there saying, don't be afraid, for I know that you're looking for Jesus who's been crucified. He is not here. He has risen. The tomb is empty. What a tremendous promise that holds. Secondly, there is an empty tomb. Let me tell you something about a young man called Philip. Philip felt like he never belonged. He was pleasant enough, but he looked a bit different, sometimes seemed unusual to his eight-year-old classmates. He was pleasant enough, and just before Easter, his teacher introduced the special project and gave each member of the class a plastic egg, he explained that each child was to go outside, find a symbol for new life, and put it inside the egg like one of those eggs that contain toys. Now, the, the class responded enthusiastically to the project, and they went outside, came back in, and the eggs were opened one at a time, with each child explaining the meaning of the symbol. There might have been a pretty flower, a butterfly, green grass, and the children were ooing and ahhing. In another, there was a rock, or a little stone. That prompted some laughter. But when the last egg was opened, there was nothing inside it. Somebody said, that's stupid. Another one said, someone hasn't done it properly. And the teacher felt a tug on their shirt. It was Philip who said, that's mine. I have done it properly. The egg is empty because the tomb is empty. What a thoughtful, unusual, but strangely true comment that is. That empty egg reminds us of the empty tomb. The empty tomb is the truth of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. The promise to all of us who will believe that we too will be raised to eternal life because the tomb is empty. To those of us who know Jesus Christ as Lord and Saviour, death has lost its sting. It's no longer something to be feared. What fear is there when we have the promise that one day we will be forever with the Lord? A father and son were travelling down the country road on an afternoon in the spring when suddenly a bee flew into the window. Now, I know that if that was our car, Ben and I would feel rather anxious because neither of us particularly love bees. But this boy didn't just not like them, he was deeply allergic to them. And the boy began to panic as the bee buzzed all around in the car. Seeing the horror 
on the child's face. The father reached around, caught the bee in his hand. Soon he opened his hand and the bee began to buzz around once again. And the boy began to panic. The father reached over to his son, opened his hand, showing him the stinger still in his palm. Relax, relax son, the father said. I've drawn the sting. The bee can't hurt you anymore. The empty tomb is God's way of saying to us, relax, my child. I've drawn the sting. The sting of the law, the sting of the way that we used to have to make ourselves acceptable to God under the old covenant has been drawn. But through the gift of God, through Jesus, death can't hurt us anymore. Why was the tomb empty? Because Jesus was alive. The angel said, he is risen. And the promise is for us too, that we can live even if we die. That's the second promise of Easter. The third is this. There's one more promise I want you to know about. It's the promise of the empty burial clothes. You see, after the angel had spoken to the women, they immediately went back to the apostles and reported what had happened. And with this incredible news, Peter and John immediately raced to the tomb to see what had happened for themselves. And when they got there, John stopped just outside the tomb, but Peter, impetuous Peter, ran straight in. And they saw that it was just as the women had said, empty. But that's not all. Peter found the clothes that Jesus had been buried in. They were empty too. But that could mean only one thing, that Jesus was alive. If someone had stolen his body, they wouldn't have removed the burial clothes and folded them up neatly and left them where they lay. Truly, Jesus was resurrected. Outside the tomb, Mary would encounter Jesus, though at first she thought she didn't recognise him. Jesus himself would appear to Mary Magdalene and to all of the apostles and eventually to over 5,000 people. He would sit down with them, walk with them, talk with them, eat with them. They'd be able to enjoy fellowship again with the risen Lord. You see, that's the promise of the empty burial clothes, that Jesus is alive and he wants to have fellowship with you today. Jesus isn't some kind of nebulous force out in the, in, in the universe influencing people. He is a living saviour. And he talked and touched and loved and healed. He had skin and bones and was recognisable. He desires to have that same relationship with you as he did with his disciples 2,000 years ago. I want to ask you a very simple question as I round up this morning. Do you know Jesus Christ? I don't mean do you know about him? Do you have informational facts about him? But do you truly know Jesus you see, you can know things about somebody. You can know things about politicians or celebrities or friends. But you can know some facts about them. It doesn't really mean that you know them. But you can know Jesus. You can know his love, his care, his power at work in your life. Jesus himself said, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and dine with him. And he with me. The promises that those first disciples discovered that day, you can have today. You can know the freedom of forgiven sins. You can know the promise of eternal life. You can know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Saviour. Why? Because there was an empty cross, there's an empty tomb, and there's empty burial clothes. I want to just finish by asking you this question. Will you take Jesus at his word? The final promise that God makes to us can be found in Romans chapter 10, verse 13. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. And so today, I invite you, if you've never done this before, and if you recognise your need of a saviour and your need of God's forgiveness and your desire to know his love in your life, call on him and he will answer you and he will come and sit down to a meal with you and you can have fellowship with him. Let me pray. Father, thank you for your word. May it guide us to respond to your gifts to us. 
The promises that you make of forgiveness, of eternal life, and the fellowship and relationship with Jesus as our Lord and Saviour. Help us to believe, help us to trust, and help us to follow you this day and always. Amen. Thank you for the cross, Lord. Thank you for the price you paid. Bearing all my sin and shame, in love you came. Gave amazing grace. Thank you for this love.
may the God of peace, who by the blood of the eternal covenant brought back from the dead our Lord Jesus Christ, that great shepherd of the sheep, make you perfect in every good work, working in you that which is pleasing and good through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory for ever and ever. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit be upon you and remain with you and with those whom you love and with God's people everywhere this day and for evermore. Amen.